privileged part of the body. And on the front of the head is the face with which we kiss, eat, breathe and speak. Our face is where we are. It's where we think of ourselves as being on show. Our face is the part which we hide when we're ashamed and the part we think we lose when we're in disgrace. Usually we leave our face carefully undressed but quickly cover it up when we're trying to escape recognition. A human portrait is always a head, unlike animal pictures. When George Stubbs drew horses, he had to include their entire body in the picture. There's something quite ludicrous about the idea of a head and shoulders portrait of a horse. Our names live in our face. Having a face, we stop being interchangeable members of a herd and become individually recognizable members of a community. By having faces which remain consistently different, one from another, all of us can recognize our separate biographies. If there were no faces, this would collapse into a swamp of confusion. And yet faces are not simply labels or placards that we use to recognize our friends. Our faces are also reliable registers of mood and motive. And we read the future of our relationships off faces exactly as we read time off the face of a clock. And yet we all know that what clock faces have to show is all that they have to tell. But it's not quite the same with the human face. Our features are telltale in some respects, but they hide just as much as they reveal. In fact, we remain more or less inscrutable behind our faces, which is quite convenient in some ways. In fact, we can still quite easily surprise each other by doing things which no one could have guessed simply by looking into our face a moment before. And yet we still look for lines of character which might allow some sort of forecast to be made. And the triumphant joy which we experience with a successful caricature arises partly from the belief that the cartoonist has somehow rather magically discovered the visible counterpart of his victim's secret and invisible self. Rather like Rumpelstiltskin having his name found out. Well, the French philosopher Bergson explains quite clearly why we find this funny. We laugh, according to him, whenever someone loses his mysterious and unpredictable freedom of action. For instance, when he slips on a banana skin and suddenly surrenders to the law of gravity. Well, the cartoonist, by making out very strong lines of character and exaggerating them, somehow seems to have plucked the secret out of his subject's invisible self and gives us the comforting illusion of knowing exactly how that person will act at every future moment. Yet reading faces is more than a parlor game. The Swiss pastor, jean Caspar Lavater, actually tried to turn these vague intuitions into a science and attempted to classify the various appearances of the human face at the end of the 18th century, hoping to create a reliable index of human types in the hope that one could read and predict someone's behavior simply by inspecting the outlines of his face. Now, a much more ambitious scheme tried to extend this idea to the human skull. According to the 19th century Austrian physician Francois Gall, the brain was arranged in a series of separate organs, each one of which was responsible for certain recognizable mental tendencies or talents. For example, the sense of aggression or the sense of acquisitiveness or the sense of logic or science or the sense of wonder even. And according to Gall, the size of each organ more or less determined the strength of the tendency. And since the swelling of these organs enlarged the surface of the surrounding skull, he insisted that you could predict the behavior of a subject simply by feeling and measuring the bumps on the head. Well, it was, it was almost inevitable, of course, that the mesmerists would become interested in this idea as well. After all, if the human mind was represented by a series of cerebral organs, it seemed quite reasonable to assume that they could influence these organs one by one by using the magnetic force. In fact, if you read reports of the so-called 
phrenomesmeric seances, there were the most extraordinary episodes. When the magnetic finger was lightly laid on the organ of wonder, for instance, the subject apparently fell automatically into the posture of prayer. And uh, if the organ of acquisitiveness was tweaked, then the hands of the entranced subject automatically groped into the operator's pocket. Well, this theory, which was called phrenology, became so popular that there was even a boom industry in these little figurines in the middle of the 19th century, which more or less replaced the bust of Mozart and Beethoven on pianos. But the idea was also taken quite seriously by a large number of important intellectuals and social reformers even thought that they could anticipate and predict criminal behavior simply by looking at the surface of the skull and then consulting the chart. And at phrenological meetings in the United States and England, the skulls of executed criminals were seriously exhibited and discussed. Well, this idea survived on into the end of the century, and the Italian criminologist Lombroso even thought that there was a recognizable criminal species, what he called l'uomo criminale. Well, the same principle was also applied to other social attitudes as well. In fact, the cranium of Lord Eldon, the notoriously reactionary Lord Chancellor, was constantly discussed by radical phrenologists as an example of his regrettable type. Now, although this phrenological notion seems completely ludicrous to us now, although it seems rather unlikely that the Creator made special organs in the brain to ensure his own worship, Phrenology, nevertheless, laid the foundation for the modern interest in the localization of function inside the human head. All this assumes that we know how the head evolved. But in order to find out how it did, it's necessary to look at some of our primitive relatives. And the best way to do this is to dredge the seabed where they live. primitive animals, things like the sea anemone, for instance, the creature is arranged on what we call a radially symmetrical plan. That's to say, you can make a cut across any one of its infinite diameters, and the two halves will be identical, no matter where you cut it, as long as you cut it across the center. The same goes for animals like the sea urchin, for example, or its close relative, the starfish. Now, when an animal is arranged on that plan, when it's radially symmetrical, it faces the world with equal indifference on all sides. There's no right, there's no left, there's no front, and there's no back. It's surrounded by a circumference of foggy possibility on all sides. Therefore, one of the most important episodes in the history of animal evolution was the development of a new geometrical plan, the development of what we call bilateral symmetry. Now, perhaps one of the best examples of this is something rather simple like a worm. Now, for example, here's something called the sea mouse, Aphrodite. Well, as you can see, it's no longer disc-like. It's no longer a globe like the sea urchin. Instead, it's got squeezed down one axis so that the only way of getting two equal halves now is to cut it down this one long axis from here to here. Well, once something becomes elongated like that, then it has a distinct attitude to the world. It has the possibility of an approach. It can move that way or this way. 
Well, now, there's an obvious advantage in making up one's mind about which way one's going to move, about moving always with this end first or with that end first. But once you've decided, I mean, biologically speaking, that you're going to move with one end first, then there's an obvious advantage in specializing certain features of this front end. Now, something as sluggish and simple as the sea mass doesn't show very much differentiation front and back. There aren't any evident sense organs at the front which enable you to distinguish it from the back. Well, you can see the next stage quite vividly in a much more advanced segmented relative of the sea mass. In this crustacean, you can see that the head end has now become much more differentiated. The eyes are now quite recognizable. And there are also very sensitive antennae or feelers which reach out into the world ahead of the animal. There's a pair of them here, a short pair and a long pair. Now, these eyes and these feelers reach out into the world beyond, into the direction where the animal is going and extend, as it were, an area of consciousness and anticipation out into that world so that that world is not going to be unexpected or sudden or abrupt. Events can be anticipated before they've come to pass on or at the surface of the creature. So that the animal is divided into two principal sections. An anterior front section, which is an organ of strategic anticipation, and a middle or rear section, which is an organ of propulsion and of movement. So this rear end is quite naturally under the control of the front section which tells the rear section where to go and why to go there. And so over millions of years the head has developed as a far-seeing helmsman which guides and controls the propulsive engine of the rear end. The first person to see it in these terms was the English neurologist Charles Sherrington. Most of his important findings on the nervous system had already been outlined and published by the end of the 19th century. By working with animals whose spinal cord had been carefully severed from the brain, he was able to show in meticulous detail that the isolated spinal cord had a complicated repertoire of tactical responses and that all these were under the control of the brain which acted as a master strategist. By 1900 it was recognized that the brain was not simply an organ of higher mental function but that one of the ways in which it exercised this higher mental function was by imposing a sort of moderating and restraining influence on the primitive spontaneity of the spinal cord itself. Now this interesting idea had already been appreciated to some extent by other scientists in the late 19th century. One such neurologist, John Hewlings Jackson, spent much of his time at the bedside of patients who were suffering from strokes and from epilepsy. These were illnesses which often involved extensive injury to the higher levels of the brain. Well, as he watched these patients, Jackson began to see that their symptoms invariably sorted themselves out into two groups. One lot he called positive symptoms, and the other lot he called negative. Even today, neurologists classify their findings in this way. Mrs. Costello suffered a stroke six months ago which paralyzed the left side of her body. These limbs cannot be used in the way that this one can. Now, for example, just grip me with this hand. Give me a good firm handshake and try and stop me from pulling away from you. It's very strong indeed. Now, Mrs. Costello, can you give me a grip with that hand? Mm -hmm. You notice that she has to use the good hand in order to assist the hand over which she has no immediate control. Now, would you try to give me a grip with this hand? Mm -hmm. One of the important features which is characteristic of stroke rather than of paralysis of the nerves in the lower part of the spinal cord is that it is accompanied by certain features which are added to the paralysis. In addition to 
what Mrs. Costello has lost in the way of movement and control, Mrs. Costello has also added something, something which we can demonstrate, but over which she has no immediate control. On the normal side, when you... There's a, just a modest response as the muscle is stretched, the muscle tightens up again. Now, when we try it on this side, something rather different happens. Although this limb is useless to Mrs. Costello, you'll notice that there is something positive. Now that's not something which you're doing, Mrs. Costello, it's something which is happening as a result of my doing something. This escape from the restraint which is exerted by the normal brain affects the whole of Mrs. Costello's left side. It's not simply the knee jerk, but the reflexes throughout this side, because I can elicit the same sort of tendon reflexes in the arm as well. Now, can you see the, the reflex extends? It's not just simply a jerk of the arm, but there's also a very nice jerk here on the wrist. It's quite exaggerated. I'll try it on the other side so we can compare it. And just let your arm rest like that. You know. See, there is a jerk, there is a response because her tendons are reacting, but it's much less pronounced than it was on the other side. And there also isn't an extension of the reflex into the hand. Here, once again, we'll go back. And you'll see how the whole limb is affected by this reflex. Do you see the way the hand nods? A very, very light touch can elicit it, you see. Don't you have to do a very slight tap, just like that? Viewing cases like this with an evolutionary eye, Hewlings Jackson insisted that the patients had somehow reverted to an ancestral condition. Apparently, the illness had stripped away the higher levels, those most recently acquired in our evolutionary history, leaving the older ones exposed. I have long thought that we should be very much helped in our investigation of diseases of the nervous system by considering them as reverses of evolution. By evolution, I mean a passage from the most simple to the most complex, a passage from the most automatic to the most voluntary. The highest centers, which are the climax of nervous evolution, are the most complex and the most voluntary. So much for the positive process by which the nervous system is put together. Now for the negative process, the taking to pieces or dissolution. Dissolution is a process of undevelopment. It is a taking to pieces in order from the most complex and most voluntary toward the most simple and most automatic. So the higher nervous system, it seemed, not only enlarged and amplified the repertoire of the living organism, but it also refined it and exerted, well, a civilizing influence on the more primitive and the more ancient parts. Well, this idea was so persuasive, it apparently gave such a convincing explanation of the clinical findings that neurologists began to interpret other observations in the same light. But as with all interesting ideas, they can sometimes be carried too far, and sometimes with very misleading results indeed. In the years that Jackson was doing this work, the University of Cambridge was slowly recovering from a long period of scientific sleep. In the 1870s, though, a school of physiology was established, and it soon became one of the world's greatest research laboratories, attracting scientists of the highest caliber. Many of these 
focused their attention on the nervous system. And most of their work, like Sherrington's, was laboratory work on animals. In 1903, though, Henry Head and William Rivers started an experiment on the human nervous system. Well, the case of H.H., or Henry Head, and his arm, began in March 1903, when Rivers charted or plotted the normal sensation in the skin of Henry Head's left hand and forearm. The area was carefully marked out into squares and in each of these squares rivers plotted the points where warmth, cold and pain could be felt. Well, by April the 25th, 1903, everything was ready and Henry Head now submitted himself to a surgical operation which was performed by his own colleagues at the London Hospital under a general anaesthetic. And what they did was this. An incision about six inches long was made in the skin of the elbow here. And the nerve supplying sensation to this area of the forearm, the thumb and the hand was cut. But it was carefully rejoined with silk stitches in order to allow the nerve to heal. Now, Head and Rivers knew, of course, that by severing the nerve in this way, they would automatically abolish sensation in the area of skin which was supplied by the nerve. But the point of the experiment, what they wanted to find out, were the stages in which the sensation returned to normal. Well, the next morning, when Head had come round from the anaesthetic, the area of numbness was carefully plotted and traced onto a photograph of Head's hand and forearm. A clear-cut area over the back of the hand and thumb was found now to be insensitive to light touch, temperature and superficial pain. For instance, when the small hairs on the skin of the affected area were tweaked, Henry Head said he could feel nothing at all. Well, the stage was now set for an experiment that was to take more than four years to complete. Head and Rivers knew that because the nerve had been so carefully stitched end to end that it would begin to regrow and recover immediately. So that it was very important to follow the recovery of sensation very regularly and very carefully. So, week by week, Head came back to the cloistered calm of St. John's College, Cambridge, and together in Rivers' rooms, the two friends carefully charted this small injured province in Head's felt self. Using the simplest possible apparatus, glass rods, test tubes filled with warm and cold water and tweezers, they mapped the recovery of feeling. Well, as you can see, the records of this heroic experiment fill five fat volumes. And if one reads these, it's very easy to get the impression of an impeccably objective scientific experiment. But the fact that one of the investigators was using his own personal subjective feelings as the essential evidence made the experiment and the conclusions which were drawn from it quite suspect from the start. Well, what did they think they'd found? Well, they noticed that sensation came back in two separate stages. Gradually, the feelings crept in from the edges of the anaesthetized area, and after a few weeks, some sort of feeling was reported throughout. Head insisted, though, that sensations could only be felt in this area if very strong stimuli were used, and that these were unpleasant, extreme, and poorly localized. Now, they called this rather rough, incoherent stage of recovery, protopathic sensation. Now, when that stage was more or less complete, 
Head reported a second phase of recovery. Now, normal feeling began to flood over this early area of crude recovery. The sensations which were now achieved by using mild stimuli were subtle and well localized. In other words, they were normal. Head and Rivers called these epicritic sensations. According to Head and Rivers, this little experiment had brought about, if you like, a brief replay or a recapitulation of the evolutionary history of the nervous system. In the first, or protopathic stage of recovery, it was as if the primitive or ancestral nervous system had been revealed in its true colors, momentarily released, as it were, from the inhibition of more recently acquired levels, it was now allowed to express itself with unrestrained vulgarity. But as the nerve reacquired full function, as it regrew, the protopathic dog beneath the skin was put back on its epicritic leash. Well, it's a bit too neat. The point is that these experiments have been repeated several times since then, but no one's been able to obtain the same results. As I've already said, the observations were obtained from someone whose theoretical interests in the outcome were involved. So what had gone wrong? Well, I think that Head and Rivers were probably unconsciously interpreting their results in a metaphorical rather than a scientific way. Their commitment to a hierarchical nervous system with successive levels was so powerful that it actually helped to shape the subjective observations upon which the whole experiment depended. Now, there's no doubt that Head and Rivers were largely inspired by Jackson's doctrine of evolutionary levels in the nervous system, and that Jackson himself drew his inspiration from the respectable evolutionary thought of the 19th century. But important ideas are not always as simple or as pure as they seem. They come from many different sources, not all of which are openly acknowledged. Now, the idea that man had a savage inside him, an unregenerated Adam, is as old as civilization itself. It seems quite likely that the spectacle of revolutionary mobs in Europe reminded middle-class intellectuals that man was only restrained and civilized by his institutions and laws, and that he could quite easily return to a state of barbarism and savagery if these artificial controls were relaxed. When Hewlings Jackson tried to find the most vivid analogy to illustrate his evolutionary principle of the nervous system, as to say the doctrine of loss and release, he expressed himself in the following words. If the governing body in this country were to be destroyed suddenly, we should have two causes of lamentation. One, the loss of services of eminent men. Two, the anarchy of the now uncontrolled people. But Hewlings Jackson was not alone in being influenced by this idea. In the 1870s, Walter Badgett, a great social theorist and editor of The Economist, emphasized the special risks of removing social restraint. Lastly, we now understand why order and civilization are so unstable, even within progressive communities. We see frequently in states what physiologists call atavism, the return, in fact, to the unstable nature of their barbarous ancestors. Such scenes of cruelty and horror as happened in the French Revolution, and have happened more or less in every great riot, have always been said to bring out a secret and suppressed side of human nature. And we now see that they were the outbreak of inherited passions long repressed by fixed custom, but starting into life as soon as that repression was catastrophically removed. Now, interestingly enough, 
When Rivers went on the first anthropological excursion to the Torres Straits in 1898 for the purpose of investigating the primitive mind, he was accompanied by the famous psychologist William McDougall, who was even more explicit on this subject. We may sum up the psychological characteristics of the unorganized or simple crowd by saying that it is excessively emotional, impulsive, violent, fickle, inconsistent, irresistible and extreme in action, displaying only the coarser emotions and less refined sentiments, extremely suggestible, careless in deliberation, hasty in judgment, incapable of anything but the simple and imperfect forms of reason. Hence, its behavior is like that of an unruly child or an untutored, passionate savage. the horrible events of 1914 must have helped to confirm this theory. Under the stress of mass warfare, as to say warfare, on a scale which had never been witnessed previously, human beings seemed to lose the restraints of civilization and they began to behave like their primitive ancestors. Or rather, to be more accurate, as psychologists like Rivers and McDougall imagined or believed their primitive ancestors to behave. In fact, the experience of the First World War played a very significant part in shaping the ideas of European psychologists. As we'll see later on, the experience of war in the 20th century has had a very strong influence on biological thought. And so, for the first time in history, the military establishments were forced to acknowledge the overwhelming psychological effects of mechanical warfare. Army surgeons, of course, are as old as war itself. Although this was the first time in history that the high command had been forced to recognize that the mind could be injured just as badly as the body. And men like Rivers were given the unprecedented opportunity of studying an altogether new illness, so-called shell shock. These awful results seemed to confirm their original suspicions that every man had inside him a primitive, incoherent individual. In fact, it was the experience of treating shell shock cases which first sent my father into psychiatry immediately after the First World War. He'd been trained as a neurologist by Rivers and by Henry Head. So by the time he was called up in 1917, his own observations of shell shock must have been very strongly influenced by what his teachers had told him. So. Oddly enough, the theory had gone through a complete circle. The idea of a primitive ancestral nervous system had been partly inspired by social anxieties about the existence of a mob instinct. This, in its turn, had influenced the clinical observation of the results of nervous injury. And these results, in their turn, were then applied to the results of a great social upheaval like the 1418 War. October's bellowing anger breaks and cleaves the bronzed battalions of the stricken wood, in whose lament I hear a voice that grieves for battle's fruitless harvest and the feud of outraged men. Their lives are like the leaves scattered in flocks of ruin, tossed and blown along the westering furnace flaring red. O oh, martyred youth and manhood overthrown, the burden of your wrongs is on my head. 
English psychologists, though, were not the only ones to have their biological pessimism confirmed by the horrors of the First World War. For Sigmund Freud, who was working in Vienna, the anarchy and violence of those years fulfilled all the expectations of his own theory. Of course, like Head and Rivers, Freud had also read his Hewlings Jackson and therefore regarded the nervous system as something which had evolved, something which had acquired higher levels, which concealed and repressed the lower ones. And this was certainly one of the ideas which led him to insist that the human personality had adjusted itself to the demands of social life by repressing the instinctive drives of our primitive ancestors. But as I've already said, the origin of great ideas is always more complicated than it seems. And although Jackson's theory undoubtedly had an important part to play, there were other influences at work as well. And when Freud visited the clinic of the French neurologist Charcot in Paris and witnessed the behavior of patients under hypnosis, he also realized that there were anarchic energies under the surface of the conscious mind. But Freud was also inspired by some of the more traditional ideas of European literature as well. The Greeks, for instance, had understood that the healthy personality was based on the restraint of the passions and that the human mind was like a skillful rider reining and restraining a couple of spirited steeds. And from the end of the 18th century on, the idea that each person housed a primitive, energetic and possibly creative stranger found special favor with the romantics. And last but not least, there was the fact that Freud, like Head and Rivers, was a middle-class liberal, someone who feared the dreadful instincts of the primitive mob. It's perfectly obvious, of course, that the injured nervous system is much less efficient than the healthy one, and that social upheaval leads to human unrest. I mean, all that goes without saying. But it doesn't mean that what's revealed on such occasions is simply an older or a more primitive state. Injury, illness and revolution are not simply straightforward playbacks of our earlier history. On first principles, it would seem extremely unlikely that even a primitive organism could hope to survive if it behaved with the exaggerated incoherence of an injured creature of a higher order. I mean, healthy monkeys or fishes don't behave like injured human beings. And, of course, the same principle applies to societies as well. The violence and atrocity of the 20th century is something peculiar to our own times. And the normal behavior of primitive people is nowhere near as savage as the abnormal behavior of the civilized. twist of history that the mechanisms with which modern man perpetrates his barbarism have provided a much more useful insight into the nervous system than any of the moralizing social metaphors of the 19th century. By 1940, speed had become a weapon in its own right. Men and machines now fought on the move, and often miles apart. Tanks, for example, were no longer sluggish and primitive, but capable of speeds in excess of 30 miles an hour. The turrets, now mounted on top instead of on the side, weighed well over 15 tons, and the guns had ranges of up to two miles. Equipment like this began to pose physiological problems which had hardly been suspected in the First World War. Well, now, the problem was this. In the years that had passed since the end of the First World War, the whole nature of combat had begun to change its character. 
Between 1914 and 1918, warfare was largely a matter of massed artillery bombardments with the guns firing from fixed positions. This periodically interrupted by large and very expensive infantry charges. Well, as everyone knows, this produced such appalling and such unacceptable losses of life that the high command realized that henceforth warfare simply had to be kept on the move. And this, of course, involved the pursuit and following of moving targets. It was now necessary to develop machinery which could spot and follow vehicles, aircraft and ships, and, of course, to maintain the aim. The instructors and engineers whose task it was to try and improve the performance of the soldiers and gunners realized that the problem resolved itself into a number of separate issues. First of all, the target had to be seen and any misalignment between it and the sights had to be accurately estimated. Well, this led to a reconsideration of the part which was played by the eye in aiming. And this, in turn, led to the redesign of the grids or gratings across which the transit of the target could be seen. One, three, seventy-five. One, four hundred. One, four hundred. But then, of course, there were also problems at the executive end as well. Using mock-ups rather like this, they were able to investigate the best form of manual control. How large should the wheels be? What was the ideal form of gearing ratio? And how much stick or resistance should the wheels have? It was soon recognized, of course, that the military engineers couldn't solve these problems on their own. It wasn't long before physiologists and medical men found themselves seconded to operational research, which took them out of their labs and into the world of Nissan huts, sandbags and guns. Here at Lulworth Cove, New sights and aiming devices were introduced and then tried out by those scientists. The soldiers were asked to perform tasks which tested not simply their ability to hit, but also to track smoothly using variously geared handles. One of the first men to see this tracking task in scientific terms was Kenneth Craik, who worked in Cambridge. He was mainly interested in the relationship between perception and action, and in the way in which the sensory information coming in through the eye controlled and guided the movement of the limbs. Crake invented one machine which proved particularly useful. It was a revolving drum, and it had a smoked surface which could be marked by the investigator with a line. Now, the operator, on the other hand, could only see a small part of this line through a slit. So as far as he was concerned, the mark which had been made by the investigator was simply a spot which moved up or down in this slit. Using machines like this, Crake gradually began to realize that the pursuit of a moving target was not simply a moment-to-moment -moment affair, and that the operator was always trying to anticipate the behavior of the moving spot, and that by retaining a memory of how it had acted in the immediate past, he could make more or less successful hunches about what it might do in the future. For him, then, the brain was continuously constructing a working model of the external world. 
a hypothesis or conjecture which was continuously being updated by the information coming in through the eye. Even a few lines can prompt a three-dimensional hypothesis. But since it is only a hypothesis, it can also turn out to be wrong when further information is provided. All the same, the ability to make perceptual hypotheses is an essential part of successful action. And this was found to apply with special force in warfare. So, instead of wild, haphazard bombardment, it now became possible, especially with the added sophistication of new shells, to hit fast-moving targets like the V-1 rocket. So, the parallel between these fast-moving targets and Craig's flying spot is obvious. But the problem of successful aiming is not simply a perceptual one. When guns or turrets are as heavy as these, the operator can't use his own muscular power to move them directly. He can only use his own muscles to control the powerful energy of a slave motor which will act under his command. To achieve a smooth movement like this, there has to be a feedback to the operator. And if this feedback is either inadequate or exaggerated, control fails completely. As the war went on, the military physiologists began to recognize that this engineering principle could also be applied to the successful aiming of a limb. And that all human movement involved power-assisted steering. As with a heavy gun turret, the nerves only steer. They don't actually drive the powerful motors or muscles. The legacy of this metaphor is to be found in the language which neurologists now use for describing clinical faults like this. <laughs> right, now, I want you to see if you can aim for your fingers and bring them together very slowly. Bring the tips of your index fingers together. Okay? Clinical physiologists now visualize mistakes of this sort as errors in the feedback loops that pass between the muscles and the central nervous system. That's right. You're right. Now, can you reach out and touch the tip of my nose with your finger very slowly? Right, now you go backwards and forwards between my nose and your nose with, your, uh, with the tip of your finger. That's right. Now, I want you to do follow... Again, please, All right, but let's do it again. Well, we're backwards and forwards from your nose to my nose. That's <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> and during the years immediately after the Second World War, the scientists who were returning to civilian life had high hopes of explaining human action in terms of the machines which they had been working on. And yet, these models have not proved quite so successful as was hoped. Now the problem is that we can only use as models things which somehow resemble whatever it is we are trying to understand or explain. Now, in the case of the nervous system, we're just beginning to face the fact that although there are many things which are quite like it, nothing that we know or have made so far or are even likely to make in the near future can even begin to reproduce its fantastic complexity.